and then get your client to a safe or cover position where now you can reassess and reassess those interventions. In other words, adjust whatever you just did. That's understandable. But if I'm just laid out here on the street and the only thing going on around me is my client is on the ground bleeding to death, I'm going to cut them up out of that clothing. You know, I'll leave the underwear on, but everything else is going to be cut open. You know, trousers open up, shirt open up. I need to see what it is I'm doing. So with that said, inside your kits, make sure you got those scissors. You know, emergency trauma shears, EMT scissors, whatever you want to call it. Next slide, Brian. We get into that, we get on. <laughs> Manufactured tourniquets. These tourniquets, the, the tourniquets that we use in our training is what we call CAT tourniquet, combat application tourniquet. Uh, we buy them off of North American Rescue. That's what's in those kits back there. Now, there's other tourniquets that you can use or that you can purchase. I, my thing with this is make sure it's a tourniquet that has been approved by the committee on TCCC because that's, that's like this committee or this group of folks. Combination of military, civilian EMT, doctors, physicians, whatever, emergency medical room technicians. They, they got this committee where they kind of oversee and approve different stuff that's being used in the emergency medical field. Okay, so if there's something that they say, well, this, is, this works well, get it. The reason I like using CAT tourniquet is because one hand application. It's probably one of the few tourniquets where you can actually use with one hand and be able to get it on. A lot of the, uh, especially when you're treating yourself, like self-aid, okay? If you're doing somebody else, no problem. But if you got to do self-aid when you're trying to treat yourself and one of your arms or hands is gone, that's probably one of the few tourniquets that you can probably get on in a short period of time and not be fumbling around with it while you bleed to death. Okay, CAT 7. Uh, you hear people talk about improvised tourniquets versus manufactured because they don't want to spend them $30 to get one because they cheap. That's not a whole lot. They'll go to Amazon and get that three for 19 and then they got something. You know, they got three kits. They say, oh man, I got a deal off of Amazon. I got these cats, okay? You ain't got no cat. You got something that might look like a cat, but it's not a cat. Because the average cat tourniquet is going to run you about $30 a piece. But they sell a lot of those, we call them Chinese knockoff tourniquets. They look just like those cat tourniquets, but they're not. A quick and easy way to, uh, to tell whether, and y'all see when I'm going to the tourniquet class, you'll see what I'm talking about. An easy way to identify if you got a real cat tourniquet is on that tourniquet, not only is it going to say cat, but it's going to have what they call an NSN number. NSN means national stock number. That's because they work with the government. They, in order to sell something to the government, contracting, you've got to have an NSN number. Those cats will have an NSN number. Those fake ones, they don't have that. All right? Next slide, Brian. We're almost there. Tourniquet application. The reason tourniquets hurt, and y'all going to see here shortly, the reason why they hurt is because when you put on a oh, yes she is. All right, so uh, when you put on a tourniquet, this is what's going on. Uh, just visualize this. When you put on a tourniquet, you have to, that, that, that band of compression is compressing the epidermis, the dermis, the subcutaneous tissue, the muscle is squeezing all that in, circumferential, so that is now placing enough pressure to squeeze the artery against the bone. That's how you stop the bleeding. And so that's generating a lot of pressure. And it hurts. It hurts like H-E-L-L. -L. And so the tendency will be for when you put that tourniquet on, it might hurt worse than the injury itself. So the person that you put the tourniquet on, they're going to fight you, they're going to resist you, they're going to say, ah, it's hurting. They're going to be saying everything. You as the protectee, or protector rather, and that's your client, hey, you might say, oh shit, okay, he's ain't hurt. He's going to pay it. I, I might need to loosen it up. <laughs> no go, okay? Yeah, you, you let them know, hey, this, I, I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to save your life. I got to do this. This is going to save your life, sir or ma'am, whatever. 
I mean, say what you got to say, but let them understand if you don't put that tourniquet on and put it on properly, they're going to lose their life because they're probably going to bleed out before that EMS shows up. So that's how important it is because when you look up here, for example, that long bone right here, the long bone up here is called the upper arm is the humerus, okay? You're compressing that artery. Arteries run alongside the bone, the long bones, for protection. Arteries ain't like right here close to the surface of your skin. Because, I mean, every time you hit your arm, you'd be ready to dang near bleed to death. So it's deep within the extremities, and they run alongside the long bones for protection. That's what protects the bone. So you're going to generate enough force with that tourniquet that is compressing that artery up against that bone. And that's why it hurts. Okay? You're pinching off the artery so that there's no blood past the point of that tourniquet application. Any questions on that? Next slide. This right here is a picture we, uh, everybody familiar with LinkedIn? All y'all got a profile on LinkedIn in there, right? Because I know Mr. Key always talked about that. I listen to this podcast a long time and said, very important. LinkedIn, not Instagram, not Facebook, your professional page on LinkedIn. Well, me and my buddy, we were up there in Sunnyvale, California a couple years ago teaching the security team for LinkedIn at LinkedIn, LinkedIn headquarters. This is one of their people right here. You see how distended those veins are on her neck? Do you see that? That's from that tourniquet application. And that was training. All right? Because when we do our training, I, I, I got to let y'all know right now, okay? I ain't got no liability statements in here that you got to sign. Not liability statements. But I'm going to tell you, though, when we put the tourniquet on, we don't play. You need to get appreciation for what a tourniquet feels like, okay? And the only way you get appreciation is have somebody put it on you for real. It ain't going to be on there that long, okay? But you want to feel it. You want to get that initial, ah, and jump up off the floor, whatever you're going to do, start crying, or whatever you're going to do, but you need to feel that because the reason I say that is, is because now you can understand what your client is going through or that person that you're trying to help because now you know what it feels like and you know why they're fighting you, resisting you, trying to move away from that pain because it does hurt. But, you know, but like I said, this is what we're doing, they're going to kill you. All right, next slide. Oh, no, go back. I'm sorry. Right. <laughs> now, uh, a lot of times you'll hear people talk about damage, you know, if you put a tourniquet on, will I lose that limb? The rule of thumb, as far as theory-wise, if you have a tourniquet on, normally uh, after about two hours, you're probably going to have some permanent damage to that extremity below the point of that tourniquet application. Why do you think that is? No circulation. No circulation. What is that blood carrying? Oxygen. And what did I tell you about oxygen? When that oxygen goes, you go. Yeah. Cells start to die. Yeah, tissue starts to die. Everything starts to die from a lack of oxygen. That arm, that leg below where you put that tourniquet on, it starts to die. That's why you have to have it amputated. But that should not be the case here in the U.S. We talked about average ambulance response time. Ain't nobody going to have no tourniquet on for no two hours. Unless you're out there lost in the woods somewhere and nobody finds you, okay? So that's a possibility. How many of y'all go hiking? And y'all go hiking and camping? Yeah. Remember that. <laughs> and y'all might want to invest in the satellite phone or something. You get up there in the mountains, you ain't got no cell phone signal. You know, sat phone. Get on that sat phone, call somebody. But anyway, uh, normally, like I said, you know, typically, you know, you're probably going to have some kind of help showing up before that time. Next slide. Last thing we're going to talk about is airway management. Now, everything ain't going to be a pressure dressing or tourniquet. If you get an open injury to your chest, you obviously you can't put a tourniquet on it. You're not going to pack anything down into it. Why is that? Why are you not going to pack anything down into that hole, sis, right here? Why would you not pack it? I've got a hole in my chest. It'll be gunshot wound. It could be I was in a car accident. 
and part of that dashboard broke off and went into my chest, or I could be out hiking with my client, and we going up a trail, and I fell on the trip and landed on a tree branch that was sticking up out the ground that I didn't see. And your first reaction was to jump up off of it. Now I got this big old hole, all right? Why did we not pack that? You kind of want to have circulation or oxygen flow. It just depends on, like, where it's at. Yeah, we said it. We, we, we said it's in the chest. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, I mean, What's in this chest? What's in that space? Yeah, I know you're on the right side. I need to ask somebody who's fucking made yeah, that. Your heart. Your heart. Right here. 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 Think about your body. Think about your body. What's inside here? What's up? What's this right here? Rib cage on the left or right? Okay. All right. What's inside that rib cage? Everything. Oh. All right. All your vital organs, heart, lungs, kidney, spleen. If you were able to pack something through that rib cage, what you think you're doing? It's locking you up. You're messing up something. You're packing some gauze into a heart or a lung or a kidney or a spleen. It's going to affect the function of that organ. So you causing just as much damage as what the person already had. So when we have those open injuries to that, we call it that space. We call it the box. We measure from the collarbone, we say from neck to navel, but actually it's more from the collarbone down to the belly button. That's the box, front, side, back. If you get any kind of open injury to that space, you need to put chest seals on you know, you wipe it so you can make sure, well, okay, yeah, I see some blood coming out of there, and we know we put a seal on that. You, the reason pressure don't really work, because when we talk about pressure, what did I say you're trying to do when you're putting compression on something? Stop the bleeding. Okay, we stop the bleeding, but how do we stop the bleeding? Putting the artery against the bone. Okay, we're compressing those blood vessels, that artery or that blood vessel, up against something solid. All this stuff in here is mush. It's, it ain't nothing, you know, you ain't going to be able to compress it against anything, okay? All right, so just understand the science behind that. Next slide. So, oh, let me, I'm sorry, go back, Brian. So we're talking about uh, when you do, uh, as far as your airway management, we do want to make sure the person is breathing. If the airway is closed off, especially if they have trauma and they go unconscious, a lot of times what will happen is, if they're laying on their back, their tongue will relax and fall to the back of the throat. And that's what's causing the airway to be obstructed. So using a technique like head tilt, chin lift, next slide, Brian, if they don't have any suspected cervical spine injury, by tipping that head back, that allows the tongue to go forward, okay? If we suspect, next slide, Brian, that they have uh, cervical spine, basically some kind of neck or back injury to the spinal cord, we don't tip that head because that movement alone could cause that person to be paralyzed for the rest of their life. Because we don't know if that bone, if there's a broken cartilage that's going to sever that spinal cord mm -hmm. just by that movement in the what we call the C-spine, cervical spine. That's the upper part of the spinal cord. Just that movement alone if you got some broken stuff up there, like cartilage or whatever, and it hits that spinal cord, hey, you just screwed that person up for life. Okay? So remember that. Next slide. So, respiration. Signs and symptoms. I already talked about this. Next slide. Basically, this is when we get to those open chest injuries. What happens with this is, when you get an open chest injury, instead of the air just going in through the mouth and nose, the air will also go in through that hole that's in that chest or in that side. So now when you're inhaling, not only do you have the air that's going into your lungs, but you have air going into what we call the pleural sac. It's that space that surrounds the lung. As that air starts to build up, it will cause that lung to collapse, just like a balloon. If it continues to build up pressure, that's what we call a pneumothorax, right? Open up, that open injury to the chest. As it continues to build up pressure, if that pressure is not released, it will progress into what we call a tension pneumothorax. So now, not only do we have pressure collapsing the lung, but we also have pressure on the heart. And that will cause the heart, it basically can cause you to go into a heart attack, okay? Uh, so anyway, 
The only thing that you can do to treat, just seal. Okay. Use manufactured chest seals, they're in the kit as well. Okay, that's why my kits are so, you know, that's that's that kit right there, probably one of the best you can find out in the market. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Now, if you didn't have a chest seal, what could you use in your we'll say right now, if somebody in this class sustained some kind of injury resulting in an open injury to their chest, open, open wound to their chest, what could you use? If you didn't have a, a manufactured chest seal in this room right now, okay, duct tape, that's good. What else? Ty, what's one? Chip Give me bag. one. Say again. Chip bag. Okay, y'all, y'all been eating chips all day. All right, I know y'all got chip, uh, potato chip bag wrappers. What else we got in here? Because sometimes you have to improvise using what you have in your environment. What about those tra plastic trash bag liners? Okay. What about uh, inside your car, inside your wallet, your driver's license or ID card, if the hole is small enough? You know, basically what we want to do is create something that we can put over that hole that's not going to allow air to pass through it. Okay, that's what you're doing. Next slide. Okay, once we put that chest seal on, if the person is unconscious, we're going to put them in what we call a recovery position. We don't want to leave an unconscious person laying on their back because in most cases, especially if they had some type of trauma injury, if that person is laying on their back, a couple things are going to happen. One, the tongue is going to fall to the back of the throat and block their airway. Two, what you think two might be? Okay, it could result in a seizure depending on the injury. What you got? Internal bleeding. Okay, uh, we almost there, y'all. Y'all tap dancing around. No, I ain't asking you to. Uh, my man right here, old school, right here with nice beard. Um. So I'm All right. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you right here. Yeah, you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he already there. Already there. <laughs> Right, okay, right in the back. Is it, is it because you want more oxygen to try to flow so it can be easier for him to breathe? Okay, well, we want it, we, we don't want him on his back because, like I said, the tongue will fall to the back if it, if it relaxes, fall to the back, block off the airway. Oh, right here? No, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of it like so, in case he's on his thing. All right, all right, that, that's what I want, that's what I'm okay. good for. If the person starts to vomit, because a lot of times with trauma, you get that vomiting and stuff like that. If the person starts to vomit and they lay it on their back, instead of vomiting it out, a lot of times they'll regurgitate it back down into the airway and end up drowning on their own vomiting. Okay, so we want to put them on their side. So one is going to keep the airway open, and two, if they start to throw up, they'll throw up to the ground. If they're conscious, they may say, hey, Doc, hey, Ty, Man, let me sit up. I feel better. Y'all got a chest seal on, but that's the only thing going on. I feel better sitting up. Let them sit up. Lean them up against a wall, up against a tree, up against a car, whatever. Let them sit up because a lot of times, if they're conscious, they'll be more comfortable sitting up as far as their breathing goes versus laying down. But if they're unconscious, remember that right there. Recovery position. Next slide. I think this is my last slide. Uh, this is a technique where we use to identify other injuries. So, like once again, our number one priority is massive hemorrhage. Then our second priority is airway, making sure they got an open airway. Third priority is respirations. Any of those holes in the chest, we get those chest seals on. Fourth priority is circulation. Any other injuries they may have, bleeding injuries, okay, uh, may have something uh, where it's going to anything's going to affect their circulation. Uh, this technique we call a blood break, blood sweep. We'll show you how to do that. Basically, it's checking. In the EMT world, they call it a uh, patient assessment. Okay. Basically, it's a methodical technique that you go from head all the way down to their toes, checking the body for injuries. Okay. Front and back. Next slide. Last but not least, hypothermia. This is often overlooked. You know, you'll treat the bleeding, you'll make sure they, they, they're, they're breathing okay, but you fail to check to make sure that person is not 
body is not cooling off. Hypothermia results from when you, especially when you're talking about trauma, it can be environmental where they fell into some cold water or if it got cold exposure. But also hypothermia is real common when you have a massive loss of blood, okay? So what happens is the body core temperature, which is normally 98.6, it will start to drop. Basically, when you get around 95 degrees Fahrenheit, the body's ability to clot shuts down. So not only do you have the blood that they lost on the ground, but also the things that you're trying to do to stop that continued bleeding, it ain't nothing working, okay? So when we talk about hypothermia, it's not based on the temperature, like right now, it's probably about 102 degrees outside, but you could be in this room right now shivering because you done, you done got hurt and you done lost a lot of blood, and you're going into hypothermia, a hypothermic effect on your body, where your core temperature is starting to, to lower. What happens then is the body will try to save itself. Before your body will just die, it will start what we call uh, pushing the blood back towards the core, okay? In other words, the core where you have your vital organs, it'll start shunting. Shunting means basically that perfusion down to the lower extremities, it'll now start reversing that. So now you're trying to keep those organs filled with oxygen, blood with oxygen or whatever, the brain. And then at a certain point after that, it'll reverse itself again. It's like what we call reverse irreversible shock. Uh, Brian? So, signs and symptoms, shivering, skin initially red, pale, cyanotic, gray, Increase in respirations of pulse. They'll start breathing faster. Heart beating quicker. Why do you think that is? Why do you think they'll start breathing faster and the heart start beating quicker? Um, adrenaline. And the circulating is right here now instead of just pumping through. Okay, y'all, yeah, go ahead, Ty. You got that look on. Y'all, y'all, y'all kind of moved around and y'all almost there. But y'all ain't quite there yet. Huh? Okay. So if the body is telling me I need more oxygen, Okay, what, what's going to give them that more oxygen? Breathing. Breathing. Breathing, that's right, because that's where the oxygen is coming towards you breathing, okay? The heart starts beating faster because the heart is what's pumping the oxygen out. So you're going to start breathing faster, trying to get more oxygen into the body, and the heart is going to start beating faster and try to start pushing it out. But it ain't going to do, it's not going to be successful at some point, okay? Next slide. So this is how we prevent hypothermia. And like I said, I'm gonna send you these slides uh, in your in the PowerPoint, email it to you. That item down at the bottom, next slide, Brian. Mm -hmm. That item down here at the bottom, I would definitely say, if you guys are on like a detail, and you're trying to, uh, especially if y'all got like multi-person detail, and you do have that larger kit that I was talking about, where uh, we'll say like your mass caching kit or whatever. This is a good item to invest in. You know, it's like a three-layered sack where you can put a person in that might be going into hypothermia that will maintain that body core temperature and keep them from just continuing to uh, go into an irreversible shock. Uh, North American Rescue, I think it costs like maybe about $129 or so. It's something that you would keep in like a larger medical kit or something like that. And once again, it's that what if. You know, what if this should happen? Next slide. Question that comes up a lot, impaled objects, okay? Everybody knows, you get something impaled into your body, it could be the dashboard from that vehicle because you got in a car accident moving from point A to point B, okay? Uh, it could be somebody fell on top of something, a stick uh, on that hiking trip, that branch sticking up out the ground. Uh, say as it relates to your home with your kids, with your babies, grandkids. It could be that kid that was running around the house and you told them to put that pencil down, that sharp wooden pencil down, and they did and they ended up falling on the pencil and now it's sticking out of their body. The impaled object works as a plug, okay? Because that's what's pinching off that blood vessel. In many, but of course there may be a case where it doesn't hit a vessel, okay? But if it did hit a vessel, like an artery or something like that, once you pull it out, you just open up the floodgates, okay? So you don't want a second guess. You know, 
let the, that's what they do at the emergency room. If something is sticking inside that person's body, you build up the padding around it to keep it from moving, okay, and secure that padding in place. Because the damage is what you don't see. What is that end that's inside that body doing? Is it moving around, cutting nerves, cutting blood vessels, doing all kinds of stuff? So you want to stabilize that and, of course, wait for the EMS to show up or if you're evacuating the person. Well, I don't know if it's in your protocol, but if, if, if you like the emergency room is right next door versus you sitting right here waiting on the EMS, you're probably going to go to the emergency room, right? You're going to evacuate. You're probably going to move your client yourself. But I would just say, say this, in many cases, that ain't always the best idea. Even though I know Mr. Keith told you part of your side advancement, you know, your advance where you, you get the locations, your medical facilities, who's going to be able to provide you your medical care, you got all these contact numbers and all that. You know, you want to know if, if we get hurt, you know, where we need to go. But keep this in mind. If you are moving, unless you can get to that location quick, what happens if you get caught up in traffic? And that person, that client is in the back seat bleeding up, okay? And the ambulance is trying to get to you, but it's caught in traffic as well, you know, because time is critical. So sometimes you may have to stay on site or stay where you're at, continue to do what you do until that EMS shows up. But you can say, well, I'm in a black uh, Chevy Tahoe, okay? We're sitting out here on uh, 77 North. Well, she, uh, the evidence might see 10 black Chevy Tahoe's, you know? Mm -hmm. How do they know the Tahoe that you in? Right. So I'm thinking about it. All right, next slide. This is my buddy. He would probably be here for the next few minutes. Larry, you was truly. All right. That's like uh, 40 years ago, 50 pounds, 50 pounds to 40 years ago. That's me. All right, that's my buddy Larry. But uh, who's also Larry's an EMT paramedic. When he shows up, I'll have him introduce himself and we'll go ahead and get to the meat and potatoes. All right, Brian, that's it on site. Anybody have any questions? Questions or concerns on anything I covered? That's the longest of my talk.